Welcome to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues of fast-growing businesses. If you're a business owner or operator looking for practical tips and solutions to scaling your business in a sustainable manner, you're in the right place. Now here's your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre. Hello and welcome to the Business Infrastructure Show, where we share tips and resources to help you cure back office blues. I'm your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre, and I'm joined today by Eric Lang. Eric has worked as an engineer in the toy industry for seven years. A graduate from the Georgia Institute of Technology, he has taken more than 60 products from various stages of development to production for retail stores like Target and Walmart. In his spare time, he volunteers as a board member of the Atlanta Society of Manufacturing Engineers, and he designs props and costumes for fun. Eric and I actually met at a TEDx adventure event that was centered around design thinking, and when I talked to him, I knew right away that I had to invite him to the show. I think What he does is so unique. I mean, it's not every day that you meet someone who makes toys, right? (laughs) And being that my background is also in engineering, I always look forward to conversations with people who design and build tangible things. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. Today, Eric is actually going to share with us the one thing we need to know about product prototyping, excuse me. So without any further ado, Eric, welcome to the show. How are you today? Great. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Now, you're a senior product development engineer at a company called Kids2. Can you tell us more about what you do there? Sure. So my main role at the company is to basically work with um, the business unit, so basically program managers and product managers, and our team of very talented designers to take toy concepts and baby gear concepts and bring them to market. So basically I'm with the product from all stages of development from basically back of the envelope sketches all the way to manufacturing overseas to shipping out for on shelf. So the entire life cycle of it. Correct. Okay. Awesome. Now I know this isn't a fair question what I'm going to ask you, but if you had to say that there is one thing that we need to know about the prototyping stage of that life cycle, what, what would that one thing be? Sure. Um, it's definitely that you need to do a lot of prototyping. Um, a lot. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. So um, to, to elaborate on that, um, basically physical prototypes can be expensive, um, but basically what you're doing by prototyping a lot with either lower fidelity prototypes or easy to make prototypes is that you're offsetting the potential cost you can incur later down the line of development, especially after you release from manufacturing. And oftentimes it is all too easy to um, basically start designing and keep designing without actually working on a prototype. And then, you know, it's suddenly too late. You have the prototype and you need to hit a certain deadline and you're sort of committed to the uh, what you've worked on without actually testing it with users yet. And that, that's actually what I was thinking of. So how do you actually know that you need to keep doing that prototyping? So obviously you have to test that with, with users. Can you kind of walk us through what that typically looks like in your world? Sure. So with toys, that's a lot of physical prototypes. Um, I guess with software and other development types, it's a little bit different. Um, But with toys, you're definitely trying to make sure that the assumptions you're making about how a child plays with it or for baby gear, how a parent will use it, you know, how they'll carry their child in it or how they'll put their child in it definitely need to be validated. Um, You can definitely have a lot of good ideas at the forefront, but if you're not testing those ideas, you really, really risk hurting your usability of the products later on. And if you have to change that, a change after manufacturing is monumentally more expensive than a change during prototyping. Mm, great point. So how do you assemble testers? Are, are the, is this a, a form of market research, I'm, I'm assuming? I'm, just a, a, I'm imagining what I've seen on TV and, and in movies where you have this 
this mirror. I think it's a, is it like a two way mirror where you have mm -hmm. people come in and then you're sitting on the other side of the mirror and they don't realize it and you're watching them test your prototype. Is that how that works? Um, yeah, I've done, I've done that before. Um, we've used video conference rooms. Uh, I, I have not actually been on a two way mirror situation, but I have a uh, remote watch, uh, people in either panels or actually people using the product. Oftentimes I'm there with the user, um, watching them using the product, asking them questions about how they liked it or why they did a certain thing when they interacted with it. Um, but that's a, that's a very official way of doing it. And that too can also incur a little bit of cost, especially with recruiting and then paying the people for their time. Um, a really like easy way to get people is to, um, if you have a big office with a lot of people or if you have a community that you're a part of, if they represent any part of your user demographic, you can just go ahead and ask them um, with almost any stage of prototype. Uh, people are typically very opinionated and they love to, like, if you're friends with them, give you suggestions on what to do. So you can gain a lot of valuable insights just from asking your friends and family. Um, just make sure with that you do ask a lot of people um, because if some people are you know, more likely to be nice to you, they can withhold potential flaws that you have with your product. Mm. And I, I just realized we should should have backed up a little bit and explained first what a prototype actually is for those who may be listening and they're wondering, well, well what exactly do they mean when they say a prototype? Can you, can you explain what that means? Again, from your perspective, and if you'd like to share, you know, if a prototype may, may look differently in, in other types of industries. That'd sure. Be great too. Okay. So at its, at its most basic, a prototype is a, for physical prototypes, it is a device that you build that is supposed to replicate some part of your final product that you're producing. And you specifically use prototypes to test assumptions you have during development and design about your end product. Uh, so to be more specific, if you uh, basically grab the handle of almost any device, I guarantee you that the geometry, the material, and the positioning of that handle went through many different iterations of prototyping. So someone was either on a 3D printer or they were carving it out of foam and they were just going through a couple different rounds of how to make that handle to make sure that it felt good in your hand, it was in a place that you were likely to reach and likely to use, and it just made sense for the product as a whole. Um, I think software prototypes uh, vary a lot more. I personally haven't made, event, made any, but in general, the goal of the prototype is to get it in the hands of users to test assumptions you have about your product. Now, you said something that's really interesting because I always thought with the physical prototype that it, it does almost mimic what the end product would be, but it sounds like that's not necessarily the case. Um, yeah, so it totally can. Uh, there are basically three different levels of prototyping you can do. You have low fidelity, mid fidelity, and high fidelity, and there's hundreds of different, different types of prototypes beneath those three different categories. So for example, a low fidelity prototype could literally be something that you draw out on a sheet of paper um, to get people's opinions on, or you make a very simple model out of cardboard or something just to get a feel for either sizing or how someone would hold it. And then a high fidelity prototype, like the highest you can go is basically replicating production. So that's gonna be like a works like, looks like model that encaptures the aesthetics and the end functionality without necessarily using production techniques like injection molding or CNC. Well, you could use CNC, but basically like injection molding, you want to offset that uh, capital expenditure until as late as possible. Now, Eric, as you're going through these different iterations of your prototype, do you kind of go up that, so go from a low fidelity and eventually work your way up to high fidelity? Um, yes, uh, very typically you do want to do that, uh, namely because the cost of a low fidelity prototype is much less than the cost of a high fidelity prototype. You're looking at basically um, something as basic as uh, in the past I've done maybe paper mache um, up to something that's CNC plastic that's fully painted, fully finished, and you're using it to get buy-in from either a sales team or uh, really, really end users that you're just trying to see if you're uh, product is marketable. That's so interesting. Now, if we could attempt to t tie this into business infrastructure, because obviously that's what this show is all about. And so like anything else, you, 
want to bring to market, building a prototype obviously takes a team. Now, for those who are listening to this show for the first time, let me just quickly define what business infrastructure is. It's just a system for how you link your people, your processes, and your tools to ensure that fast growth happens in a profitable and sustainable way. So, Eric, Mm -hmm. from a physical prototyping perspective, who are the specific people, processes, and or tools that are typically used throughout the various stages of prototyping? Sure. So for, in, order, in order for you to make a prototype, um, you definitely want to have design and engineering involved. And uh, depending on the size of your business, that can be anywhere from actual employees that you have on staff to contractors or even design and engineering firms. Um, basically, someone has to be able to instruct a prototype maker on how to make that prototype or, you know, make the prototype themselves. Um, And going into detail about a design or engineering firm, uh, there are quite a few of those out there where they have a team of designers and engineers who work together to hit your requirements for both the design and eventually the prototype. Mm -hmm. They they basically offset your R&D process or your product development process if you don't actually have um, a full team in-house. So basically, you just pay them either per project or per hour, and they're able to work with you um, to develop basically your your idea and your design. And then sometimes, depending on the, the firm that you work with, they could also carry out user testing as well. Okay. And then in, in terms of tools, obviously, whatever tools are required, depending on the type of, of product is actually being designed, as you, you kind of alluded to that already but in terms of processes Mm -hmm. can you so when we met at that TEDx adventure event they were talking about design thinking and I remember there were there were different stages Mm -hmm. so with prototyping are there typically certain stages obviously you you start with that I initial idea Mm -hmm. and as you said earlier that could be something as simple as sketching it on the back of a napkin Mm -hmm. Um, all the way to finished product. What are those main stages? Because obviously there are a lot of processes that are taking place throughout the entire development life cycle. But if you had to kind of break it up into stages, what would those stages look like? So with regards to design thinking, prototyping is itself a stage of design thinking. Um, Basically what you're doing in design thinking is you're defining the problem, um, working with users and getting to know them. Um, well, that's, that's a little bit reverse. You work with the users first, you define the problem that they're having, and then you design your solution to that. And then after design, that's when prototyping comes in. And you just sort of iterate through that after testing um, to make sure that you get through a lot of users and a lot of different prototypes. Um, I would say that design thinking is a little bit newer. Um, I don't remember the exact origins of it, but it's within the past 10 years it's come out as a process that uh, designers both digital and physical designers have been using. In the past, um, with physical products, waterfall process is typically a little bit more common where you're doing something very similar to design thinking where you're basically creating requirements for the products and then uh, designing and engineering to those requirements and after that, finally testing the prototype. But basically the main goal here is to iterate enough times that you're very, very comfortable that your prototype meets your set out requirements, either from business goals or from the goals you derive from your user um, out of design thinking. And going back just really quickly, if, if, if it's okay, to talking about the, the different types of people that make up your team. So when it comes to finding these testers, are you working with business development people, marketing people? Sure. So uh, at my company, we specifically have an insights team who goes out and uses uh, outside resources to contact, uh, in my industry, parents and children um, to bring them into either our office or maybe sometimes we'll set up a a test site uh, at a different place like WeWork or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think in other companies, the marketing department might set that up um, or even the like business function of the company. It's like the, the product management team. Okay. Yeah, I was always curious about how that, you know, how you all actually work together to make something like that happen. Mm -hmm. 
That's awesome. So we're going to take a quick break really quickly. And when we come back, I'd like for you to share some resources where we can learn more about physical or, or product, 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 excuse me, <laughs> like a tongue twister, uh, product prototyping. So let's take a quick break. Today's episode is brought to you by Equilibria, an operations management firm specializing in business infrastructure for fast-growing small businesses. The faster your company grows, the more people you will need to add to your team without clarity on what should be done, who should do the work, and when, where, why, and how, your business is guaranteed to miss the mark in customer, employee, and vendor satisfaction. Equilibria can develop a business infrastructure that calms the chaos and provides a recipe for sustainable success. Visit eqbsystems.com today. Mention the Business Infrastructure Podcast for free 30-minute phone consultation, eqbsystems.com. And we are back with Eric Lang. Eric, before that break, you were telling us about the one thing we need to know about physical prototyping. And that one thing is the fact that you need to do a lot of it. And you were recommending or kind of walking us through, rather, the different stages of that life cycle from idea to actual product on the shelf with prototyping being one of the main stages of that, of that cycle. Mm-hmm. Can you share some resources with us where we can learn more about prototyping, physical prototyping in particular? Sure. So with physical prototyping, there are a lot of hands-on skills. If you're looking to do it yourself um, that you'll definitely want to develop a little bit. Um, basically in my Uh, learnings, the best place to learn is YouTube. Um, And I have two channels in specific to talk about. Um, One is Dragon Innovation. They are a design and engineering firm, like I mentioned previously, but they lay out the entire product development process. And then they also explicitly go down to very specific details about different kinds of manufacturing, especially the costs involved in manufacturing. Um, for specific products. And they've, um, they've definitely captured a lot of the product development process and also have like explained it in very simple and very um, easy to follow terms. So if you're, if you're completely new to the whole product development life cycle, um, you can definitely go into their channel and have no problem understanding what they're talking about from the start. Um, so that's, uh, that's YouTube channel number one. Uh, number two is a little bit more fun. But as I mentioned previously, uh, prototyping has costs. And with product development, you definitely want to keep your costs low. So um, in order to do that, you might want to learn different techniques to keep your costs low instead of basically shipping your designs off to uh, a very expensive prototype house without actually testing those parts of the prototype beforehand. And the channel I'm going to recommend is Tested. Um, That's a channel that's owned and produced by Adam Savage uh, from Mythbusters. And... Throughout that channel, they have a couple different segments on the channel about uh, making props. And while this is more or less a physical prototype, the prop making techniques can be applied to uh, actual products. Um, So specifically his one day builds, he goes through a lot of different techniques of how to fabricate different types of things to look like different things. So he's building a spacesuit out of like PVC and fabric can get off the shelf, Um, obviously not. Uh, spacesuit fabric. So there's a lot of cost savings techniques that you can learn or at least be inspired from that part of the channel. Um, Previously, we mentioned the actual process for uh, design thinking and product development in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I read a book recently called Sprint, How to Solve Big Problems and Test New Ideas in Just Five Days. Um, The book basically takes the uh, Google practice of sprinting where it's very similar to design thinking where you're basically working through very specific problems and generating low fidelity to medium fidelity prototypes to test assumptions that you're gaining from those problems. Um, And it's really, really good because it outlines the entire process of a sprint and then also gives you options on how to integrate it into your company or even just start doing them. Um, And they are very good ways to basically rapidly develop ideas for products that you can later forward into prototypes. Just listening to you, I'm thinking, my goodness, this is so daunting. <laughs> but you, you're an expert at this, so, so this is your world. But can we talk a little bit about outsourcing to a, a country like China? Sure. Where, I mean, obviously that you could achieve a significant cost savings. 
I've heard different people talk about this over the years, and the number one concern is intellectual property theft. Can you talk about that a little bit too? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we do a lot of work with Chinese vendors, and we have a couple prototype houses that we're very fond of. Um, when it comes to IP theft in Asia, you definitely want to make sure that you have non-disclosure agreements ready to go and ready for them to sign. Um, even though you have those, there's still no really fast guarantee that you won't be the victim of IP theft. Um, the best way to really, I guess, avoid that is to invest in certain relationships over in uh, China or Vietnam. So that might require going out on a trip to visit the country and visit vendors that you contacted over um, maybe Alibaba or another form. Um, like the majority of my trips that I take are strictly for visiting vendors and you know keeping those relationships going while pushing the product through the product development process. But you know if you feel that you can trust your vendor, um, that goes a long way over a document that they signed and you signed exclu- uh, mutually. That's a great idea to actually if you for people who can afford to do that, to actually just travel there and meet face to face. Yeah, it gives you a, a good idea of what they're capable of too. Um, oftentimes when we're trying out a new prototype vendor, uh, we are sometimes surprised by the quality, even though through communications, everything seemed perfect. Um, but then we receive a prototype in-house and you know if it's not perfect, we either have to ship it back or ask them to make another one. So that, that definitely increased the cost. But if you're over in Asia, um, you can sit with their team and go through multiple iterations of a prototype in as little as a week, especially if they have the, uh, their prototyping machines on site. And that can save you um, mm. months out of your development timeline. Wow. That's a very good tidbit to know. <laughs> Well, Eric, unfortunately, we're coming to a close. How can people get in touch with you if they want to pick your brain a little bit more about prototyping? Sure thing. Um, The best way to get in touch with me is on LinkedIn. Um, You can find me at Eric Lang. Um, I guess there's a a headshot of me on this podcast, so just look for that. And I uh, work at Kids Too, so you can just look me up that way. And any plug for Kids Too? Up Um, to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, kids too. We make uh, Baby Einstein, Bright Starts, uh, and a couple other products. Um, it's definitely a company with a good track record for product safety. So you can definitely find us in stores, um, no problem. And if you have any questions about prototyping or product development, you know, again, feel free to reach out and get in contact with me uh, via LinkedIn. Okay, Eric, thank you so much for being on the show today. This was this was great, and you, you've personally answered a lot of questions that I've always had about prototyping. So thank you, for, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, too. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Now that we've heard from Eric, is there something that he said that resonated with you? If so, how are you going to apply that to your business? As a reminder, Eric told us that the one thing we need to know about prototyping product prototyping oh my gosh why can't i get this right eric (laughs) the one thing we need to know i'm just going to say prototyping the one thing we need to know about prototyping is the fact that we have to do multiple iterations of the prototype specifically he defined a prototype as a device that you build that replicates some part of your end product. He also told us that the reason why prototyping is so important is because you want to make sure that your assumptions are actually validated. Testing is key. You have to make sure that what you've prototyped will actually work. Again, you have to go through multiple iterations sometimes to get this correct. And prototyping can actually fall along a range from low fidelity to mid fidelity on up to high fidelity. Always make sure that you have non-disclosure agreements in place. And if you do decide to outsource your prototyping to a country, another country outside of America, make sure that you visit that country and establish relationships with those vendors. It'll go a long way in making sure that you secure your intellectual property. If you want to learn more about Eric and how he may be able to give you pointers with your company's prototyping, 
definitely look him up on LinkedIn. His name is spelled E-R-I-C. Last name is Lang, and that's L-A-N like Nancy, G-E. Again, that's L-A-N-G-E. As a reminder, we'll have a link to Eric's LinkedIn profile in our show notes, as well as all of the resources that he shared with us today online at businessinfrastructure.tv. Did you know that we have a YouTube channel? Yes, that's right. You can now find this show on YouTube. You'll also be able to find a link to the channel, again, on businessinfrastructure.tv. So definitely make sure you go there, subscribe to our channel, and click the notification bell so that you'll know when the next episode airs. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, stay focused, be encouraged. This entrepreneurial journey is a marathon and not a sprint. Until the next time. Thank you for listening to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues with Alicia Butler-Pierre. If you like what you've heard, do us a favor and subscribe, leave a rating and review, and more importantly, share with your colleagues and team members who could benefit from the information. Join us next week for another episode of Business Infrastructure with Alicia Butler-Pierre.